Hello again, this is Lee from Fragile Continuum, lead developer of Fragile Existence. I thought I'd do another development update. It has been probably about a year since I've done one of these. And what I've done is I've pre-recorded some footage and now I'm basically playing it in front of myself whilst I narrate and talk you guys through what has changed since, you know, what has been updated, what I've worked on since the last uh, big update. And uh, as you can see here, we've got the warp conduit, which you, um, you know, your fleet is warping in and the solar system is loading in the background. You can pause here, press on the space bar. Pause is a tactical pause, which means that you can still interact with things. So I'm sort of uh, demonstrating a little bit here. The blue outline shows you what you've got selected and the bottom left corner is uh, like the, the unit palette, which shows you the commands you've got available as well as the modules that are on the ship and then the bars on the side for modules and storage and the like let you get into the nitty gritty of what the, the ships uh, actually have inside them. Uh, so we're approaching the end of the warp now and there were volumetric effects in there as well now it's a little bit more snazzed up and here we are at the warp uh, gate entrance slash exit and these little circles you can see expanding around the ship represent the sensor range and the or the scanner range or however you prefer the um, there's actually a module aboard the bridge which gives you that possibility and then when you uh, finish or conclude a warp sequence the um, the sensor will sort of grow to show that it's being reactivated so we've arrived in the system of course you can go to the system map straight away there's four planets that I've created beforehand and what you can do straight away is start zooming around and sort of it looking um, from like a bird's eye perspective, a satellite view, if you like, of what there is to find in the current system. So we haven't done anything yet. We haven't moved the fleet around. Uh, we're just inspecting these planets. And this is the best we can do from space. We can't get down to ground surface. We can only sort of get a cursory sort of glance at what there is available. Uh, so there was the uh, sort of new volumetric effect on the gas planets. We sh so far showed uh, a total of four terrestrial planets, or sort of Earth-like as I call it internally. And then there's one rocky planet. We've got a city there. That looks interesting. Um, but you can't see anything more than the sort of bare essentials, the, the features, the ground features, trees, sort of obvious things that you would pick up from orbit. You have to actually send units down to these planets to actually get a better look at what's sort of available down there, like resources and, uh, you know, other forces that you'll have to contend with. None of that is available just from the glancing from orbit view. So we've now sort of taken on moving the fleet to the first planet. You always start uh, nearby uh, a singular planet, which you can define in the solar system editor. In this case, we've got a warp gate. Now in fragile existence law, um, the warp gates are used to sort of make the warp experience less problematic um, it, you know it focuses the warp sequence so that when you come out of a conduit it's quite safe if, if that makes sense so uh, if there's no warp gate it means there's a chance that something could go wrong during the warp sequence you can still do it but um, we developed the warp gates so that we could sort of direct the conduits much better and make sure that warp travel was safer uh, anyway we have <laughs> moved to this planet you can move the ships independently and they then enter orbit sort of automatically based on their sort of current orientation and uh, this is why you see them fan out um, as we're seeing here uh, we're not really showing much that hasn't been seen before in in this particular case um, some better graphics all around uh, sort of better effects there's a, a lot more ships than there used to be and um, what we're getting to now is I've placed some wreckage, I suppose, or debris in orbit. And what we're showing is that the, the scanner range will allow you to sort of ping objects, not just uh, wreckage, but other fleets, uh, other units. And you get that little yellow flash uh, or white flash as it sort of enters that area or enters the range of the scanner 
And what will also happen is if you move the ship or your ships in general away from, in this case, these pieces of wreckage, they will actually disappear. If they're not being continuously pinged, eventually they will disappear. That's why you've seen, uh, apart from the fact that some is just exploding here, we're also sort of seeing that they'll disappear if you don't maintain that sort of what I call pinging. Um, uh, so that's all working now on the ground as well. We've got sort of scanning systems that can track things and I think it's working pretty well. They visually, maybe we need to make these spheres look a bit more pleasing. Um, but, you know, generally it's all working. What I'm doing here is I'm actually adding units to the stage and deck in the hangar aboard uh, some select ships here. Obviously, depending on the ship, you'll have different modules available. Some of them are sort of geared towards dropping units on the ground. Some are going to be more geared towards um, launching fighter craft. Some are more geared towards building bases in orbit. Some just like carrying things. Uh, some are sort of more geared towards carrying personnel and things like that. So we've got the, what I'm demonstrating here is the split item system. So every single unit, uh, capital building in the game has its own inventory. And what we're doing here is moving inventory items, materials from the, the carrier, which in this case is the Faraday, the support carrier to this stockpile, which is a box that you can lower onto the ground. And those items then become available to units and buildings on the ground. It's a way of moving goods around um, manually, as it were. There's also ways of moving it around automatically. But usually, you know, in these sort of games, there, there are always going to come times when you want to do it yourself and make sure things are happening exactly as you want or preempt the automatic systems. We got some fighters here. The fighters haven't actually changed all that much. Uh, and they definitely don't do any really cool dog fighting or anything of that sort of nature yet. Um, we'll get to that. Uh, currently, they are very good scouts, though. They have uh, little sensor bubbles. And they're much faster than capitals, so you can send them around the planet and they can pick up objects a lot quicker than the capital can. So generally you want to send ships like that ahead of your fleet because you know the capitals are quite slow and numbering and you don't want to expose them to any danger if you don't have to. So we're finally launching that, um, that stockpile to the ground along with an engineer unit and I believe a sort of scout unit, which is a little uh, quad nice fast unit that has a center bubble and can go around the planet and find resources so currently as you'll see here the we can see the trees we can see all the ground terrain but we can't see resources so we we have guessed in this case where we think a good spot is going to be to find some resources so this quad flight quad here Celeste our job now is to move it around and try and work out where the resources are we definitely could have could and should have done this before we sent down uh, any base contingent uh, but of course I know where the resources are so I've uh, gone ahead and placed it right next so here we have some magnesium and you see it, it sort of pops into existence in the same way as the wreckage did in orbit meanwhile our engineer unit the tokamak has built base delta when you place a base structure it will automatically create uh, so, so when you place a building, sorry, it will create a base in that area. If you place any more structures in that area, they'll automatically be added to that base uh, within a certain prescribed region. So that stockpile uh, prefab that we've landed next to the base is automatically being added to base delta. Uh, it can actually be picked up again at a later point when we don't need it, but it's a great way of kickstarting a base. So we finished building the staging area. The staging area is like a construction site of course, of sorts in that any buildings near the staging area will automatically get construction materials moved from the staging area to the new structure. We can see uh, the leveling drone, it leaves the back of the engineer unit and starts leveling the ground. This is a throwback to games like The Settlers where you use is to have to send a little guy out to level the ground before you could build the structure itself. I always thought that made a lot of sense. So, you know, if you build on a flat area, there's a lot less leveling to do. Uh, but as you can see, there's quite uneven terrain in this game now. So 
I thought uh, it'd be nice if, you know, you can still build on rough terrain. It just takes much longer to do it. And so we see the little mover drones moving materials around. I've got this guy, uh, I've got the Solaris selected so you can see the material vanishing. <laughs> Sorry, being moved from the Solaris. And I've now selected the staging area where it's going to um, deposit those items. In this case, uh, I believe that was steel bars. And straight away, because that uh, the staging area had material available for construction, it just sent it over to the settlement, which the engineer is currently building uh, himself. So the engineer unit is a very versatile unit. It can harvest resources, it can level ground, and it can obviously build buildings as you can see here. We definitely need more work on the animation side of building. Uh, this is just sort of a sort of temporary animation. So I placed a few more buildings there and now I've hopped back into orbit. This is the orbital assembler. So this is the orbital equivalent of that ground engineer. Xerxes here and it's it's quite a nimble little uh, ship um, but obviously what it does is the parallel of the engineer on the ground and you can actually place orbital constructions and it works almost exactly the same as what you've just seen on the ground you can spin it around you can set the orientation you can obviously build it wherever you like and once you place a orbital construction it creates an orbital base which is the parallel to the ground base and any other constructions you place in that area will then be part of that orbital base as well we can see in the top right that the grouping is automatically happening uh, the leader portraits are temporary we haven't really added leaders to the groups yet um, and you can see the orbital construction from the ground there uh, meanwhile we're building an ore depot which is the structure that allows you to start mining resources we've hopped back to the quad which we're sort of moving around the planet to find more materials we've got some uh, iron we've just found there and you know so there's quite a bit to be getting on with we won't lie but you know you do have a tactical pause you can you probably will spend quite a, a lot of the time pausing to make sure you're maximizing your sort of use of time as you play we're not you know we're clearly not making the best use of all our units here we've just sort of let them sit around just so i can demonstrate some sort of key sort of gameplay components here here we so the structures on the ground that i've placed so far the first one is what i call the anchorage the anchorage what it does is it allows any capital ships near the anchorage to allocate their items or their inventories to the orbital base so if you move capital ships sort of right next to the anchorage they essentially are it's like they've anchored with that base they, they are part of that station and so similar to the staging area it means that inventory can flow much rapidly much more rapidly to um, any buildings that there are I'm hopping back and forth here obviously but this is what the game is it's all you know ground and orbit and lots of planets to be thinking about all at the same time Lots going on. What we've done is we've assigned the ore depot to mine this magnesium. And what it will then do is just automatically mine that material until it can't find any more. There's a harvester unit that sort of sets out and starts uh, zapping away at the material. And it collects it when the, um, when the support units or the harvester unit has a full inventory. It will then go back to the ore depot, deposit it, and then head back out. Uh, so you see here we've got the other orbital construction building, which is a air uh, separation facility, sorry. And this takes a little while to build. The idea of this thing is that you can gather various gases. There's terrestrial gases and there's gas from gas planets, gaseous gas, <laughs> so to speak. and you can separate it into four main uh, gases, oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen, and xenon. And they are used for various other purposes um, throughout your bases. Uh, xenon, in fact, is the main fuel you'll need for your ion drives, which are used for orbital movement. 
And you see here we're finally getting around to sending um, two ships away to the rocky planet, which we've got in the system. We've also, off screen, I, I believe, just sent two units to Lucid, which is the gas planet. You know, splitting the fleet, not splitting the fleet. These are the kind of decisions you're going to have to make whilst you're playing. You know, how you know safe do you feel leaving uh, your freighters in a particular spot? Uh, anchored perhaps uh, with an orbital base. Um, we have... Oh, okay, so we're now looking at the refinery. This one in, is equipped to be a steelworks. So the idea is you build a refinery, and then based on what modules you install, it, it, it basically defines what materials it can make. So this one has a blast furnace which can create iron from iron ore we're not actually mining iron ore but we did bring some down in the stockpile which we are obviously still making use of eventually the starport which we can see the tokamak is currently building kind of replaces that cargo container so the cargo container is a great way to get a base going but eventually the starport takes over as your sort of your castle like in settlers it, it, you know, it's a warehouse where you can start storing things and it sort of automatically takes it in as they're fabricated so the steelworks there is now started to create some iron from iron ore and coal ore. Uh, again, we haven't mined that in this particular base. What you'll generally do is you'll have bases that are geared towards certain things that you need. And, you know, you'll be seeking out certain materials. Uh, there's a grand total of eight main uh, mineable resources. There's the four gases I mentioned before. And there's many, many materials that you can make from them. And then further materials as you sort of enhance them. And, you know, ultimately uh, these better materials are what you need to create ships. And, you know, your better weapons. There is uranium in the game also. So, you know, you need that to create nuclear stuff. Uh, I haven't showed that yet. And I don't believe I do in this video, but it's a, it's like a green mineable node. So the we also have an oxygen furnace which can turn iron bars and I believe it's oxygen, uh, similar to real life uh, processes. Um, but obviously, you know, I haven't used every possible material in the real world. I've sort of created an economy that's much more basic and, you know, game-like, which kind of makes a lot more sense. Uh, but oxygen and iron bars let you get steel and steel is the sort of your usual building material. Um, you know, for your more advanced structures, there's also aluminium and uh, titanium. Titanium is usually used for ships. In this case, you can see it's used to create some ground units. The garage has a module, the vehicle shop, which allows you to build extra ground units. Because, of course, we're assuming, we, we've got to presume that the fleet doesn't always have these things. It depends, obviously, what you start with. I'm showing here that you can provide waypoints. So this is a series of ground waypoints. So you could leave the the quad and other sort of scouting units to just roam around the ground uh, across all the planets and find resources. Uh, resources don't actually disappear if they're not being constantly pinged. That wouldn't make much sense. Uh, and that would be very annoying, let's be honest. You also see we found another type of material here near that base. That's um, uh, like mixed. It is a bit like um, the materials in your phone, you know, the, the sort of more base components that you need for things. Um, uh, so here we're doing what we will generally do with gas planets. Uh, create orbital bases to that are geared towards harvesting the air or the gas layers of the gas planet. <laughs> I'm saying gas a lot. So this is where the air separation facility will generally be built because we're wanting to sort of skim the gas plants, collect the gas, and then uh, separate it, I suppose, into the four main gases that we actually need. That's the main way that you'll get those gases. That's the main way you'll get oxygen, which we saw we needed in the refinery. It's the main way we get xenon, which we need for our ion drives. Currently, the drives don't actually use fuel, but it, you know, it is actually going to. <laughs> I'm going to, you know, click that switch at some point where you know everything's actually going to use ammunition and fuel. Currently, that doesn't work very well for me. Uh, you know, testing things. So this is a Mars-type planet. Uh, you see, it's very rocky. There's a lot of uh, 
<laughs> remnants of crashes and um, things plunging onto the planet and old sort of stations. We didn't actually send a scout down to that planet, so we don't even know what's there. We can't harvest it until we actually get a scout out. Here I'm demonstrating that we can obviously pick things back up. We've just taken the engineer back up to the ship and I believe um, we're also about to pick up the stockpile. Uh, so we're done with that now. We've got a star, star base which you can also use as a landing pad and we can bring further material down from the fleet in orbit. Uh, so we no great need of the stockpile anymore. Hey, so this is moving to the second terrestrial planet or Earth-like planet. This is the one where we spotted a city from orbit and we're thinking, well, let's go take a look at that. And so once again, uh, I've just, as a debug, I suppose, I've just popped some units into the hangar bay of this sport carrier and now I'm just choosing the best landing site. Obviously, I can't see the resources yet. I probably would be smarter to deploy some scout units first. There may eventually be ways of detecting things from orbit, but I'm trying to encourage, uh, you know, fleets to want to go down to the ground. Um, you know, I've taken all this time to build these, um, yeah, kind of nice looking planets. I, 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 it would be a bit of a shame if you could play the whole game without needing to bother going down to them. This is also why I haven't really implemented asteroid mining and the like, because, it's, well, they're probably going to have all the resources you need, right? You're never going to need to get into a ground confrontation. So as before, we've sent the stockpile down. You don't need to send a stockpile down, but it, it definitely does help get a base going quicker. The engineer, in fact, could just go and harvest resources itself. It's a lot slower than the like the main harvester unit in the, from the ore depot, but you can do it. It's, it's designed so that you've always got a fallback. As long as you've got an engineer, you can start again. You can always get back to where you were. Right, so this is another new unit, which is the transporter. So this is actually geared towards moving personnel around. It hasn't been particularly obvious yet, but uh, in the top left, when you've got a unit selected, or a capsule, sorry, or a building, not a unit in this case, there are the available amount of personnel is shown in the top left. Uh, here we're just pathing around this uh, city. Um, I still need to do some work on cities, so the idea is they're going to be much more interactive than they currently are. They're currently just sort of decoration. Um, but you're going to be able to send units uh, into buildings to sort of collect uh, wounded people, perhaps, or materials or uh, rare blueprints, that kind of thing. Like going into cities is actually going to mean something. And you're usually going to find um, other ground forces there who are sort of like, no, don't take our stuff. Um, you know, they don't trust you. There's not really probably going to be any diplomacy, so to speak. So you're usually going to have to fight them off in order to get to the valuable materials that you can find by investigating these skyscrapers and the like. Uh, so this transporter unit, we actually deployed to the planet with a uh, personnel count of 50 civilians. There's seven different types of personnel, uh, which I'm probably going to forget right now. Um, but uh, civilians are very useful for, uh, sorry to say it, quite menial work. Um, so we've used the, the item storage system to move the personnel here from the transporter to the settlement and the settlement can accommodate those people and when it does you see in the top left there we've got 50 available civilians that's the white number and as we allocate them to modules in the base that number of available civilians goes down. Uh, allocating people to jobs is quite important because if you don't those functions just don't work. And so we're collecting that transporter again. Uh, we're going to take it back up to the capital and put another load of 50 civilians in and bring them down to the planet. Uh, there's also engineers, there's uh, marines, there's uh, pilots, there's medics, there's scientists, and there's naval officers. And depending on the color of the modules aboard the uh, capitals or in the buildings, or even in the ground units themselves, we can allocate certain personnel and then the, the functions that we've allocated them to get better. The efficiency goes up so we can build things faster. We only assign one civilian to a refinery 
then we get a very, very slow processing speed. If we allocate 50, we get those items made as fast as we possibly can. Right, so that concludes the main sort of demonstration of what I wanted to show off. It's been a probably much longer video than I expected, which is pretty normal for me. Uh, but it has been a while since I've done one of these. So uh, this is just a sort of speed um, production of how I produce that planet. Obviously, I've skipped the actual city building bit here. Uh, we're just showing how the, the procedural tools are used to generate a planet, which is fairly bare. And then we go in and handcraft the actual environment itself. Well, you can see it kind of takes some time just to do a little area. We're applying decals, which um, automatically apply themselves to the ground. And then we're, we're placing groups of trees and grass and sort of other details independently, like those structures. And uh, the tools exist to let you, you know, change the amount that you're putting down in a certain area. You can create, you know, based on the little circle, you can see there that I'm moving around. And um, I'm actually only using a very limited number of um, stamps, as we might call it. Uh, there's only 12 different tree types. There's eight different resources. There's like four different grasses and something like eight different buildings. I mean, it's a very, very small palette of tools currently. Um, but you know, that'll grow as I get into content creation, which, you know, isn't super important when you're still working on mechanics. But eventually, you know, there'll be a lot, lot more stuff. And I have to go through this process of populating each of the planet. I might just sort of make it a bit more procedural so that the trees are at least placed a bit more automatically. Uh, anyway, that concludes the, this um, development diary. Hopefully it won't be as long till the next one. Okay, thanks for watching.